yeah, I should have ironed my shirt. I didn't think to do that either. <laughs> I don't think I've ironed a shirt for decades. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the last event for our spring 2021 series of the West Hollywood Aesthetics and Politics Lecture Series, The Game of the Real, Art and the Knowledge Project. My name's Amanda Beach, and I'm the Dean of the School of Critical Studies and faculty on the MA Aesthetics and Politics Programme, which this series grows from um, here at CalArts. First, I'd like to thank everyone at the West Hollywood Public Library we know that we'd not be able to run this series without their generous support, which has been going for years now, allowing us to bring people together to address the stakes of philosophical, political, and aesthetic questions in culture and society today. And I also, big thanks to all my colleagues and staff at CalArts for all their work. And of course, as well as you, the audience out there for taking the time to join us today. I hope you'll find this series of talks thought provoking and of course, please add your questions to the chat in the YouTube area as we go on. And the format for this series has been three sets of talks, each featuring two speakers. Our first session was with Ana Longo and Tristan Garcia, and our second featured Chiara Bottici and Boris Andreka. The videos are archived here on the YouTube channel if you'd like to watch them anytime in the future. But today I have great pleasure in welcoming Mer Maggie Roberts and Nandita Biswas Melamfi. They will each speak for around 20 minutes and then we'll have some time to open this out to the audience for a larger discussion. And as you're likely aware that each seminar in the series, we explore a different topic. And this spring, our theme has been the game of the real art and the knowledge project. And this has invited questions of the role of art in and as systems of knowledge and representation, how knowledge has been key to a project of emancipation, as well as how knowledge as critique has emancipated itself from itself, which has borne out particular suspicions regarding any project of political emancipation. We'll look at these issues in the context of a history of knowledge and its effects, our attempts to know, explain and grip objective reality, objectively, or the task of knowing things as they really are, rather than as they appear to be, we know has revolutionized our understanding of the world out there. But at the same time, what we've learned has also revolutionized our self-perception, transforming conceptions of ourselves as free, self-determining beings to another view of ourselves as increasingly contingent, limited, one-dimensional, alienated and dispossessed. And we can see then how the discoveries of science from Copernicus to Darwin and beyond have altered our self-perception, but so has critical theory, art and philosophy. Here critiques of modernity have defined the project of reason as ultimately an interface with its limits in confrontations with the unknowable. And today we could say that many politicians, theorists and artists alike have given up on critiques of reason and the project of knowledge altogether, turning towards cultural positivism, relativism, and new materialisms where we cannot make fi fixed assurances between what is known and unknown, what is real and what is appearance. And here, myths, beliefs, dogmatisms, aesthetics that press upon the obscurity and uncertainty of knowledge expand to characterize our experience as nature until the world is configured as an entanglement of the forces of knowing, believing, doing. Just reflecting on our last session, questions of pluralism were forefronted at the intersection of politics and aesthetics, where Chiara Bottici delivered her politics of the imaginal in the Narca feminist manifesto, and Boris Andreka leveraged the aesthetics of didacticism and power in his artwork that leaned into the aesthetics of a lecture and a sermon. Both Boris and Chiara's works stressed the questions of the image as a force in the world, but also something that was in parallel to it. 
for Chiara, this question of the political hinged upon the necessary intersection of concepts and scales from the local to the global and from the identification of solidarity with others to the concept of a generic life. For Boris, the scene was pressed in subterranean architectures of the non-human whose conceptualization demands a reordering of the theologically infused space of the given. But across the whole series, we have tried to stress the complex relation between how the understanding supplies itself with what we take to be reality in itself and how mediations manifest what we take to be the case in various and diverse languages that span the artistic and the scientific. In a world beyond the assurances of a classical metaphysics, we might find ourselves making specific anchorages for our rational and imaginary capacities via securing temporal, pragmatic and unverified grounds, a kind of pragmatism that may still be haunted by a specter of the indeterminate and crisis-ridden character of not only the future as a political project, but the transient aspect of the address from which we think it. But other investigations focus on this disjunction at the heart of knowledge. Here we can ask how entering the scene of the disjunction is central to how we imagine a future and how and if aesthetics plays a role within such an inquiry and in such a rational imagination. And I think that our speakers today will be able to push these different views and others of the aesthetic further. And now um, I have great pleasure in introducing uh, first Nandita Biswas Melamfi, who is Associate Professor of Political Science an affiliate in women's studies and feminist research, core faculty in and former associate director of the Center of the Study of Theory and Criticism and current director of the Electro Governance Research Group, all taking place at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. She is co-author and co-editor of several works, including The Three Stigmata of Friedrich Nietzsche in 2011, The Digital Dionysus, Nietzsche, and the Network Centric Condition 2016, Apps and Affect 2015, Larval Terror and the Digital Dark Side 2014, Cosmopolitan's Social Inclusion and Global Futures 2018, and Full Spectrum Ops, the Emergence of Larval Warfare forthcoming. And we're all looking forward to that. Um, currently, she's Assistant Editor of the Canadian Journal of Political Science, as well as Associate Editor of Interconnections Journal of Posthumanism, and the title of Nandita's talk is Full Spectrum Ops, The Emergence of Larval Warfare. Um, our, but our first speaker, um, who will speak before Nandita today, is Mur Maggie Roberts. Roberts' practice is underpinned by themes of machine vision, speculative worlds, shamanism, and techno-human evolution. She explores these individually and as part of the collaborative artistic group, Orphan Drift, which she co-founded in 94. Her methodology involves detailed research, immersive multimedia installation and cross-disciplinary collaborations with scientists, theorists, musicians, coders, digital artists and activists. Collaborating with Etic Lab and the Serpentine's Creative AI Lab, current projects consider artificial intelligence through the somatic tendencies of the octopus, exploring other systems of perception and proprioception. Recent exhibitions include Becoming Octopus 2020, If I Were Salafopod, Telematic Gallery San Francisco, which was also Art Forum's Critic Choice in 2019, Still I Rise, Feminisms, Gender and Resistance at Nottingham Contemporary 2018, Unruly City, Dold Projects, St. George in Germany, Matterfiction's Barado Museum in Lisbon in 2016. Her work was also featured in Fictioning, The Myth Functions of Contemporary Art and Philosophy by David Burroughs and Simon O'Sullivan, published by Edinburgh University Press in 2019. Roberts is also a research fellow with Goldsmiths University uh, Visual Cultures Department. And um, Maggie's paper today is called Navigating the Pluriverse, Fictioning Science and Interspecies Communication. So thank you for listening to my quite long introduction today. 
Um, and I hope you're going to enjoy these talks. And I'd now like to hand over to Maggie. Welcome, Maggie. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Amanda. Um, OK, so I'm going to read some ideas and context for work, show some slides and um, and and we're going to screen videos which I'll, I'll speak over. Um, the all the works available on the Orphan Drift Archive website um, where sound is a very important element of the work but uh, there's not time for me to speak about the work and for you to listen to it properly so it's just visual. And um, so responding to the provocations of the Game of the Real project about particularly what, if any, is the role of art in a constructive project such that art might demand and enable us to reorientate the very idea of what knowing is, what thinking is and what reality is. Um, so central to the collaborative artist Orphan Drift, um, and we talk about the uh, as Orphan Drift as a collaborative artist rather than a collection of people, uh, because although there are a couple of core um, women at the heart of it, and we have been we co-founded in 1994, um, we think of it as a signal or avatar that tends to um, gather through a series of sort of synchronous events, the people it needs for particular projects. And um, these people also change according to the exigencies of the time, particularly in terms of technological expertise. Anyway, so central to Orphan Drift is the exploration of permeable thresholds between the concrete and the virtual, of invisible currents and currencies that become effective frequencies in our habitats and fantasies, futurity impacting on the present and conversations between human and machinic processes. All these have been part of a continuing attempt to expand what it means to be human. Linearity, control, representation, single point perspective, fixed figure ground relations are some of the things we've dismantled in order to produce sensations of fluidity, uncertainty and multidimensional possibility set against the human centrism that defines the Western Enlightenment worldview. Um, okay, slides. So this is an Orphan Drift Manifesto flyer from the mid 90s. And apart from being slightly naively hopeful about some of the um, possibilities for technological evolution in capitalism, um, and not in a way not lots changed. Um, And during this same time, Simon Reynolds wrote of our early video work in his essay, Seeing the Beat, Retinal Intensities in Electronic Music Videos. Orphan Drift represent dissolving, ego melting, boundary hemorrhaging femininity. They consciously articulate their work as an attempt to close the gap between the visual, the tactile and the oral. There's all these abstract abject looking pulses and filaments and oozings of color texture combined with abstract patterns. The overall effect simulates a sort of retinal trembling as though vision itself was wavering. The eye is restored to its materiality as a jelly-like orb, a muscle capable of being stressed or strained as opposed to a disincarnate, invulnerable perceptual apparatus. The aim of Orphan Drift's work is the liberation of texture from its environment of energy flux from contoured form. We call this aesthetic machine vision, and this has informed our work for over 20 years. We've courted glitch, accident, iteration, and deliberate misuse of first analog, then digital, 
encoding visual technologies as forms of generative disturbance. From these experiments, we cultivate presences that become an agent in or character for a specific work, a form of collaboration with machines where art practice makes space for the unknown and places imagination at its core, producing visions of possible embodiment, perception and proprioception, and increasingly of porous relations between the synthetic and the organic. This kind of relationship is built into working with digital imaging softwares. Although I may have an idea of the sort of effect certain decisions will have on an image, the result is always a collaboration with the software and involves recognising and amplifying an unexpected outcome that has the potential to manifest a particular idea. Can we play uh, video too? My asthma, please. So leaping forward 23 years to 2018, miasma was inspired by failed water hyacinth terraforming experiments. The synthetic environment gradually transforms a decaying urban hinterland orchestrated by an androgynous swamp demon. Waste becomes elemental and provokes change in the environment, traversing virtual thresholds. I worked with digital imaging and coding experts to explore the aesthetic, technical and theoretical possibilities of LIDAR scanning, Google Deep Dream code and data moshing. The chimeric monsters generated by Deep Dream iteration became agents of decay and the data mosh glitching phenomena of dissolution and liquefaction. LIDARs used to portray moving from real landscape into virtual dimensions. Particular locations were both filmed and scanned so that the LIDAR, as well as Deep Dream and Data Mosh versions, could be layered onto the real to suggest the breakdown and transformation of matter. The inherent dimensional fabric of LIDAR captured data presents the viewer with the uncanny experience of travelling into what's called the back face of an animation, its inner surface inside the turning landscape or object we look through a virtual skin that is not ours and this video is about 15 minutes long and has a very um, intense soundtrack oh could we play um video three if ai In Donna Haraway, Staying with the Trouble, she talks about speculative investigations that become propositions that become paradigm shifts. The next video, If AI Were Keflopod, in 2019, is one of our AI octopus fictioning explorations. Quoting Clark Buckner in the exhibition catalogue, it postulates an AI coded by the somatic tendencies of the octopus, conceiving consciousness as not only more artificial, more technologically distorted and dispersed than previously understood, but also as more rooted in the body and the sensuousness of the flesh. We constructed a narrative that assembled the four videos in a repeating color sequence using a mood diagram we developed after researching the unique color languages that octopuses use to communicate and respond to their environment. Two overlapping projections achieve a disorientating disruption of planes in space, whilst two flat screens further interrupt the sense of scale and surface. The videos are deliberately generated from mostly similar source material, so that iteration happens at different scales, in different textures and opacities. There are subtle tempo differences, bleeds between organic and synthetic, filmed, LIDAR and blender generated images. LIDAR is used here to suggest the infinitely complex information processing of the environment by a non-human entity, whether octopus or AI. LIDAR also portrays the imagined shapes of an AI becoming cephalopod, partly point cloud, partly wireframe and partly sculptural with a luminous synthetic skin. Deliberately awkward animations mimic the filmed octopuses, portraying a different kind of alive. The uncertainty of figure, ground, planes, frames and image relationships in the work 
is an attempt to give the viewer an embodied and perceptual experience that's fluid, unfixed and morphing. The work presents a lot of questions about the formation of the notion of intelligence. Where does the model of intelligence come from for the development of AI? And what are the implications of those choices? It ultimately suggests we do not know what we're doing in creating these systems. So some of the on-screen texts suggest threat or catastrophe, whilst others are more about unknowing or advancing embodiment or sensuality as worthy aspects of intelligence. It's a shame you can't really read any of the most of the texts. Um, yeah, they're all on the website if anyone's interested, which is orphandriftarchive.com. So reviewing other minds, the evolution of intelligent life by Peter Godfrey Smith. Amy Srinivasan writes, in evolutionary terms, octopuses are the closest we can come to knowing what it might be like to encounter intelligent aliens. Such otherness holds up a mirror to teach us about the limits of our own understanding and embodiment. The majority of the octopus's neurons exist outside its brain the arms can taste and smell and exhibit short-term memory. The octopus is, phenomenologically speaking, in a hybrid situation. Its arms are partly self and partly other, which is why it's been called an embodied cognition. And in Vampirotuthis Infernalis, a treatise, Willem Flusser writes, their world is constituted as a dynamic conglomerate and the impressions are of plasticity of form and sensation. He talks of cephalopods, volatile imminence, and legendary camouflaging techniques that enable the sender to become invisible to its receiver. He terms the information age an octopoid revolution. We play video four. So again, Donna Haraway, in her book, Staying with the Trouble, talks about how much detail matters in creating stories and what detail is focused on. We've researched octopus cognition and behavior extensively, and I learned to free dive and work with an interspecies communicator in order to imagine the worldview of an octopus for my becoming octopus meditations part of IMT Galleries 2020, This Is Not A Me, This Is A Not Me, rather, online COVID lockdown exhibition. This work developed a formula for merging distinct political, ecological, philosophical, scientific, and aesthetic agendas into a seamless fiction. The voices fold between octopus, AI, and occasionally human perspectives. The first of the eight meditation sessions begins. You float in viscous, silky liquid, dappled by light rays stretched and polarized into a kaleidoscope of synthetic color. Turning slowly, mesmerized by being in a horizonless world. Turning slowly, becoming the textures and frequencies of the coral you're resonating with. Merged, intimate, indistinguishable to the visual sense, resonating through touch, taste and smell. The ocean moves through you. She's there, although you won't see her, being as the rock, and your depleted imagination keeps her unseen, barely possible. What needs shifting is the relation of human perception to its difference. So each session immerses the meditator in aspects of octopus consciousness. 
and it uses sort of Deepak Chopra formula um, of introducing, um, you know, a meditative state, guided breathing, and then um, goes into a story. And this, these ones are about the octopus's spatial awareness, biology, seeing skin, polarized light vision, camouflage understood as becoming other, its curiosity, pain, interaction with humans, and finally it fuses with an AI. Scientific research informed my imagining, providing tools for interpreting some of the interspecies communication downloads. These came as a series of initially disconcerting visualizations and physical sensations, which made me think about how we know things. Here the body receives information that's then interpreted by the mind. It's the first site of intelligent response, and this we need to develop in order to re-engage with the pluriverse. Pluriverse being a multiplicity of different coexisting life worlds. So this is it becoming a fusing with the AI, the end of the last meditation. So um, yeah, so as well as LIDAR, which is mostly what's happening here of a cave that became an underwater interior for this, for the meditations. This project used Blender software to develop experiments in patterning, texture, these are some of the LIDAR, oh yeah, sorry. Um, patterning texture and color communication fields and in conveying eight, as in eight arms, simultaneous viewpoints. So it wasn't ever using, well, very rarely using actual octopus as a um, visualization tool. It's kind of, trying to imagine into the sensations. And these are some of the blender, uh, like these were octopus arms that um, were trying to be reflecting polarized light in their camouflage makeup. So yeah, these sorts of viewpoints that um, I was trying to generate was made possible by VFX innovations in animation softwares. Together with visual coding, they're key to manifesting experimental part synthetic non-human worlds. This was um, trying to put a cloth skin onto a rock. Um, and then I accidentally put the cloth physics onto the rock instead of the cloth. So they kind of, became something of each other, which was a, that's the kind of glitch or accident I was talking about earlier. And um, yeah, I sort of haven't looked back from that moment. It's been an important part of what we're developing. So that's the rock skin and the cloth rock. Um, yeah, so Together with visual coding, they're key to manifesting experimental part synthetic non-human worlds. Digital animation, as media historian Deborah Levitt says in Animatic Apparatus, is a tool for developing perceptual and aesthetic languages that no longer privilege the human and move away from the recognizable towards the unknown. 
its expansive and questioned subjectivity, gender, reality, materiality. Animation can model new ways to negotiate the in-between of worlds, open up possible bodies, spaces, temporalities. It produces mythical dimensions. It's, it's vis viscerally intimate and neurospeculative. What we don't know is a generative space. That's a really inspiring line for me. Um, so yes, here's an octopus, a common octopus, no longer sadly found in British waters. Um, they're one of the most curious of the octopus species. Uh, no, it's not species. Uh, people. Um, so I'm moving on to talk about ISCRI, which is um, Interspecies Communication Research Institute, under those letters. And it's our most ambitious collaboration to date, working with cutting edge machine learning research and development team Etic Lab based in Wales and partnered by the Serpentine Gallery's R&D platform, the Creative AI Lab in London. We see ISCRI as an open experiment in interspecies communication. It's an attempt to flip the assumed science experiment relationship, i.e. we will not be in control. The collaboration itself is an experiment, an interdisciplinary inquiry between established multimedia and computational artists, machine learning technologists, cultural theorists, an interspecies communicator, a sociologist and marine scientist. In development for over two years now, ISCRI proposes training an AI that gathers data from sensors placed in an ocean mesocosm housing a common octopus, which is what you're looking at here. Inspired by their famed curiosity, we hope that it responds to art made for an octopus inserted into its underwater environment. These responses will be registered by the sensors, measuring, for example, colour change, light, movement, water pressure. The AI system will evolve through the latest unsupervised learning models, ensuring that it's not learned primarily from a human agenda, but from a fellow distributed consciousness, an octopus, operating in an uncertain and fluid environment. C. Rani Mukherjee of Orphan Drift conceives of the mesocosm environment and its art, octopus and AI triangulation as a single complex artwork. So mesocosm's um, an enclosed space that's a much more natural habitat than um, like a, you know, aquarium. Um, isolated. So the artworks made for an octopus, as we're trying to think into, will respond to its distributed intelligence that does not prioritize vision-led perception in the way a human does, but interprets the world more through 360 degree touch, shifting light and dark, water pressure and chemotactile information. The video content will be modified by the AIs it develops, which should in turn mediate the octopus's responses and feed these back into the AI's learning patterns. This process will, over time, we hope, produce visual material that both articulates and responds to an octopus in its liquid environment and will not, we assume, reproduce a human-centric aesthetic. We hope the AI might communicate with the octopus in ways we cannot recognise. By offering streams of pattern, colour and shape that we can attach less human-centric meaning to and responding to any octopus interest by producing variations on the content it engages with, we may learn to think differently. We will have to become sensitive to abstract and in inconclusive forms of interaction. So these are all early prototype experiments. Um, yeah, this is a sort of another rock octopus. Um, stills from uh, animation still very much in progress. 
Um, and Deborah, Deborah Levitt states again, the focus here is on the set of cultural assumptions and epistemologies that frame and structure the modes of experience and forms of life generated at the intersection of materialities of communication and perception. It is precisely here that we find new forms of life and modes of vitality emerging. So we're trying to create layers of environment that float off each other, pixelate suddenly or become octopoid. So you're not sure what you're looking at. Um, well, I mean, whether it's something you're under a seabed suddenly or become, you're, it's something's becoming a skin or morphing back into a rock shape. Um, and these are some of the kind of close up wanderings into some of the spaces that we're generating. Um, and trying to disassemble your sense of believing you're in a world that's stable by again like pixelated um suddenly really awkward pixelated bits come like in if ai were kephalopod the really clunky animations flat graphic animations mimicking the um octopus animals very fluid movements so lots of attempts to destabilize and move into and through and under and too far into. So these experiments are infused with the shapes and colours captured in underwater filming sessions. Here working with BBC cameraman James Luden to evolve viewpoints that simulate octopus movement, perspective and tactile navigation. Um, so this is some of the terrain that we've been modeling some of the synthetic what we're calling mimic skin reef on um, with some efforts to make part of what one's looking at look like a, a polarized vision oh there's an octopus um, So we'll try and probably move a bit, like in creating the backdrop or terrain backdrop, we're trying to move a bit into real underwater footage that's filmed in a very um, uh, excessive way, you know, like using all sorts of lenses that are macro or like a sort of proboscis lens that means again in the real you're not really recognizing what you're seeing could we just quickly play the last um number five mim mimic skin video i don't think that's the beginning thanks so yeah you saw a little of this earlier maybe in one of the stills, but this is um, skin patterns coded by Duncan Patterson using Turing's reaction diffusion system. Um, and then I tried to color them, the dots, so they look a bit more like a skin camouflage. And this is a touch sensitive nine brain simulation. So if the octopus touched the screen, one of these would move towards it. Um, and then we have the potential to develop some self-organizing digital entities that the octopus can interact with here, um, created by George Sims using Houdini and Unity software. Things are all at really early stages and um, I'm not apologizing. I'm just, it's a very painstaking, I'm finding for me used to making hours of just sort of mush, video mush. This is the whole new world. Um, yeah, so I'm working with um, a young woman called Megan Bagshaw in Blender to build a mimic skin reef that will 
play with our assumptions of bigger ground stability, what's alive, what's felt by an octopus moving across a reef environment. Um, yeah, these are some of the sort of things that are going to lift off the reef and get absorbed back in. Um, and this is some of the layers of reef that will float off or mutate and or fit in with the real, that's, yeah, like coral, fit in with the kind of real backdrop. Um, yeah, and it's very clunky movement because um, Meg's just moving it like so we can film it. <laughs> it's not animated yet. Um, and the idea of a floating ground as well is something we want to play with a lot, like that you fall underneath it. Um, so I was asked yeah, this is nearly finished. I was asked recently by a um, kind of quite extremely, oh, it's not nearly finished. Could you fast forward a bit, if possible, to until there's a different image? Yeah, I'll try there, a bit more, a bit more. Yeah, thanks. I've been finding it quite hard to get a balance that looks real sometimes in something very synthetic, um, which is another interesting learning curve of trying to get that play as to a space of unrecognizability, either from the real or towards the real or folding into the synthetic. Um, yeah, so I was just to end, I was asked recently by someone who's a very um, experienced 3D imaging um, artist, like slightly affronted. He said, what exactly am I looking at here? And that gave me great hope that we're making some progress. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. That's Thank you so much, Maggie, for that amazing presentation. There's so much uh, to think about there. And um, yeah, just, just even thinking about the, the, I guess, the liberating constraints of the animation products that you're working with as well, like what, what that is for to, how it's played out in your practice. And I hope we can com come back to questions like that after we've heard from Nandita. So uh, here I go. I'm going to hand over to Nandita. Um, welcome, Nandita, and uh, take it away. Thank, Thank you. you so much, uh, Amanda and um, Maggie. The in, those images, your words, the shapes, the choreography is uh, incredibly compelling, and uh, it's so interesting. As I, you'll you'll see. There are similar themes in my presentation as well, except they're coded a little bit differently. And I also kind of refer to the octopus uh, later on in my, in, in my talk. So I'm just gonna give you a, a little bit of um, sort of context. Um, more and more, you know, we're seeing sophisticated campaigns and machinations of socio-technical manipulation that are becoming weaponized. And my area of interest is in how to conceptualize this as a mode of warfare. And um, in addition, how to conceptualize it as a new construct of warfare. So this work is part of a book and a kind of larger research program to study the socio-technical transformations and disruptive effects of emergent technologies on the practices of warfare. Um, I've had a longstanding interest in technicity and 
manipulative and or the persuasive capacities of techniques, tactics, gestures, diagrams, that is with forms of transcription that have several possible meanings and that use ordinary acts and facts as hooks. Um, these are gestural ecologies that are engineered to track, trap, and hook. And so there's a kind of predatory ecology that is at play here. And I'm just gonna quote uh, Gilles Châtelet who, who does magnificent things with the gesture. I quote, he says, the gesture refers to the distribution of mobility before any transfer takes place. The gesture envelops before grasping and sketches its unfolding long before denoting or exemplifying. Already domesticated gestures are the ones that serve as reference. A gesture awakens other gestures. It's able to store up all the illusions, provocative virtualities without debasing it into abbreviation. So the theoretical concept that really mostly drives this project is that of the larval, which is meant to be, in this case, a kind of shorthand for the masked, emergent, and spectral mode of contemporary practices of warfare. And it's very interesting that the word larva in Latin is the word for mask, which does refer to you know, the biological sense in which insects, immature insects mask their adult forms, but there's also an older usage of the term referring to ghost or specter um, as that which is shrouded, uh, especially in the sense of something that falls outside the spectrum of standard perceptions, uh, deriving from the old French word masquerade to blacken, to darken, and strangely enough, related to the English word mesh. So as you'll see in this audiovisual presentation, um, larval warfare is a, is a mode of warfare, I'm gonna argue, that doesn't behave like war at all. Rather, its operations are duplicitous, enmeshing, spectral, and obscure. It feeds on ambiguity and ambivalence and is as such highly ambidextrous. So this is a 20 minute recorded talk with visual materials that gesture towards these themes. So you can play the video now, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Nandita Biswas Malanfi and today I'm going to talk about fuller spectrum operations, the emergence of larval warfare. But before I start, I'd like to thank WAP, the program in aesthetics and politics, and all the great people at CalArts who made this event and this series possible, especially Amanda Beach, her graduate students, Natalie Bush, and Steph Smith. It's not often that one gets the good fortune of being invited twice. And for those who might remember, I was invited to WAP in 2018 by Dr. Andrew Culp, during which time I first introduced the topic that I'll be unfolding for you today, namely the emergence of a peculiar kind of contemporary warfare that I call larval warfare. This is part of a book that I'm writing about the stretching of thresholds between war and peace and the extension of full spectrum warfare into the domain of everyday life. Last time I introduced the concept of larval warfare by arguing that the practices of everyday life have merged with interfaces and interface effects glasses or contacts, windows and mirrors, laptop screens, smartphone surfaces, bank machine kiosks, fast food ordering consoles, library catalogs, digital ads, when you're on the metro, when you order things online, when you log in at work, when you register for courses, when you pay your taxes, you are constantly coming face to face with screens, interfaces, and overlays. Everywhere you go, the world is being packaged and repackaged, framed and reframed by such interfaces. These machine hallucinations are so common that you might not even be aware of the number of screens that you're navigating daily. As Marshall McLuhan had prognosticated 50 years ago, not only would communication and information networking become routine and societies would orient their social practices towards the formation of media ecologies, but the proliferation of new media of communication would blur conceptual and actual hierarchies between military and civilian jurisdictions, expert knowledge and popular culture, as well as conflate the boundaries between war and peace. McLuhan also knew that these thresholds of ambiguity could be exploited and even weaponized. He writes, when information moves instantly to all parts of the globe, it is chemically explosive. 
It is the normal aspect of our information flow, which is revolutionary now. The new media normalized the state of revolution, which is war. The media of communication are not mere catalysts, but have their own physics and chemistry, which enter into every moment of social alchemy and change. Future warfare will look less and less like the conventional portrait of big battles with dueling state militaries facing off one another using high intensity weaponry and maximum force. This is not because in the future global conflicts will disappear to be replaced by peace, but because future warfare will not appear in the same forms or behave in standard and conventionally identifiable ways. Warfare will no longer be held in check by policy and politics. And the nation state will not be considered the only important actor in the business of warfare. Nations will consider their own domestic populations to be equal or greater threats to national security than foreign enemies. Top-down, state-centric designs of power will be disrupted by the emergence of information contests as civilians and other non-state information actors compete with states to gain influence over social networks and the shaping of public opinion and perceptions. Warfare is being transformed by socio-technical media and the mediatized tendencies of societies dependent on information and communication technologies. Rather than being an extraordinary and highly visible military instrument of last resort for nation states, the media of communications will embed warfare into the very fabric of ordinary everyday life to be waged by social groups, civilians, social networks, firms, contractors, and even social media technologies, in addition to nation states and governments. Today, warfare is conducted not only in military battle spaces by martial personnel using armed force and weapons. Increasingly, warfare is creeping into the realms of everyday culture and sweeping across social networks using familiar and ordinary platforms of social communication as weapons for gaining advantage over opponents. This is not the same as conventional warfare, which is based on military dominance and elite command-driven armed intervention. This style of warfare mimics peacetime behaviors. The ability to be vague and to exploit vagueness becomes advantageous. This kind of warfare cannot be identified and measured by its martial characteristics alone. Warfare comes to encroach upon civilian arenas and to seep into civil society. Civilians are deployed as agents, targets, and weapons. When warfare becomes ordinary, commonplace, and routine, the boundaries between war and peace become theoretically and empirically blurry, and the thresholds between warfare and socio-technical mediation become ambiguous and open to exploitation. It becomes possible to conduct warfare without declaring war, circumventing the legal standards of acknowledged warfare. Marvel warfare is strategically imperceptible, obscure, and ambiguous. Because it is emergent, libel warfare bypasses mechanisms and processes set up to regulate warfare. Psychological warfare, propaganda, and subtly exploiting civilian perceptions, opinions, and cultural practices become part of the arsenal of a fuller spectrum of warfare. In larval warfare, friction and use of force are absent, and divisions between the categories of military and civilian are made irrelevant. When warfare becomes larval, it can surreptitiously creep, seep, and sweep into the very micro-processes of everyday life to become normalized. Larval warfare blends in with the ordinary and can mimic, exploit, and weaponize ordinary behaviors to gain advantage over opponents. Instead of using force against opponents, action is transformed into techniques that are not evidently coercive or disciplinary. Anti-expertise is emphasized, and distraction is deployed as a way of subverting opponents. This is a construct of warfare in which the rationales and zones of non-combat are reconceptualized as obscure, blatant, and predatory non-battle zones. This style of warfare is not based on the behaviors usually associated with conventional fighting, armed conflict, or the use of force, nor is it synonymous with unconventional fighting, like drone strikes, guerrilla tactics, or urban warfare. Rather than behaving as dominating or domineering, larval warfare encroaches upon ordinary life, making use of the appearance of ordinariness, cunningly entangling itself in civilian networks, and incrementally merging with the very media of informational and communicational exchange to exploit socio-technical vulnerabilities from within. Hostile motivations and belligerents remain couched in civilian, aesthetic, ludic, and communicative techniques designed to appear ordinary. Digital cultural techniques and technological regimes and social media become fertile grounds for the use of warfare techniques like covert surveillance, tracking and targeting to influence civilian domains and social relations. 
Larval operations mask their character, motives, and weapons, having a spectral quality that bleeds into various environments, encroaching imperceptibly and undetectably. Larval warfare, unlike standard and non-standard forms of warfare, is not definable and thus not acknowledged as warfare, requiring no declarations of war, no delimitations of battle space, and no regulation by policy. Warfare objectives can be operationalized without friction under the radar of normal, unnoticeable, and benign everyday activities. Online and offline environments become non-battle spaces for the conduct of larval operations that seek to shape tendencies, influence networks, and manipulate balances of power. Warfare permeates civilian societies and cultures through technical ordering and the prioritization of technological rationales. The synchronization of the techniques of warfare with those of digital culture enacts a mission creep into which the objectives of warfare quietly seep into everyday practices. Information microtracking and mass collecting, metadata and traffic analyses and microsurveillance techniques gratuitously proliferate in the guises of new culture. War machines. Oh, so uh, that that stopped all of a sudden. Steph? I think we just had a glitch with the sound. Um, we can start it any second now. I think it... Um. Manifest itself that? through its own production, its own products, but rather through its way of using the products imposed by a dominant economic order. The concept of full spectrum dominance was introduced into military doctrine not only to expand combat capabilities and concretize state superiority in conducting high tech warfare, but also to redefine military priorities and extend the military's traditional role beyond war fighting. In high intensity warfare, the standard model, conflict must be defensively deployed, formally declared, legally acknowledged, and confined to conventional land, air, and sea battle spaces. The aim of standard warfare is to use force against enemies to achieve kinetic dominance while protecting civilian non-combatants. Implementation of offensive strategies, network-centric warfare, such as drone operations, and hybrid warfare, focusing on information operations, including cyber attacks, and the rise of cross-domain coercion and other-than-war operations, have led to the turn to non-standard warfare. Techniques and technologies used to wage non-standard warfare, however, have altered the strategic importance of unconventional and emergent battle spaces. While the stretching of thresholds has led to the rise of non-standard operations, it has also led to the emergence of another unacknowledged practice of warfare that is yet undefined. In addition to the concepts of standard defensive operations and non-standard offensive operations, I propose that a third construct of warfare is emerging that could be called larval. Larval warfare recalibrates and extends full spectrum capabilities defined as the superiority resulting from combining military with social, economic, political, psychological, and technological control. Unlike conventional defensive armed warfare, which is bound by the international laws of war, larval warfare is latent. It exists and continues despite the absence of overt hostilities. It is the disguised and subversive non-military dimension of larval warfare that enables making military gains without the use of force. Larval warfare seeps, creeps, and sweeps into civilian cultures, thereby widening the spectrum of battle space beyond conventional defensive and unconventional offensive conceptions of warfare. Indeed, to harness the trends and potentials of digital social mediation has become priority both for conducting warfare and for conceptualizing military doctrine. For instance, commanding the trend is a social media mechanism of persuasion used in social networking that is fast becoming a weapon of warfare, involving the exploitation of pre-existing social networks by subversive agents, especially through the use of algorithmic and automatic techniques in order to covertly introduce propaganda effects into social media platforms and to ensure the quick and cost-effective circulation of messages, narratives, and false information. It's not simply that social media have become used as tools of warfare but also that military rationale and practice has struggled to keep up with and adapt to the quixotic transformations and permanent disruptive effects of ever-expanding digital networking practices. To quote Sarah Oates, it's not so much that we need to understand the digital aspect of modern warfare. Rather, 
we need to see that digital warfare is a new way of understanding war in the digital age. Part of the challenge lies in finding appropriate frameworks for conceptualization. In political sciences, as well as propaganda and security studies, what is called information warfare largely refers to the strategic use of information and disinformation to achieve political and military goals and is associated with disinformation campaigns sponsored directly or indirectly by state and or state sponsored actors. Such state centric approaches seek to explain information warfare in terms of top down strategic models of power. Standard conceptions of information warfare share assumptions that states and state-sponsored agents are the main actors weaponizing information. State-centric assumptions, whether they are pro-state or anti-state, advance a state-centric view of information dominance in which state elites use disinformation in military and strategic terms to manipulate and control civilians who are predominantly seen as passive or victimized recipients of state action. Social media is seen primarily in terms of state-controlled flows of information, and ordinary citizens are viewed as users and consumers. State-centric approaches as such can't really capture the ways in which citizens are taking active roles in curating disinformation. As a 2018 recent study by Golovchenko et al. suggests, Neither disinformation nor counter disinformation is as strongly state driven as is often assumed, especially in the case of Ukraine. Citizens are not just the purveyors of government messages. They are curators, both of disinformation and counter disinformation, even in the context of state sponsored information and state controlled media. Citizen driven social media has also challenged the role of traditional mass media's production and dissemination of news. The digital age facilitates user-generated content and visibility as citizens actively search for and produce new information. This is not to say that citizens are not subject to state-controlled and pro-government discourses, but they can curate information and generate their own content as well. As Golovchenko says in this study, information warfare is not what it used to be. In the age of social media, individual citizens can be more influential than states and professional mass media in spreading information. We need to adopt new approaches. Information operations are not only used to supplement or complement, but rather to replace conventional warfare. American military doctrine, for example, has shifted focus to what is called stability operations, defined as activities to promote and protect national interests by influencing the threat, political and information dimensions of the operational environment through a combination of peacetime, developmental, cooperative activities and coercive actions in response to a crisis. Considered as a revolution in doctrine by some, and by others as the next step in the evolution of warfare, the significance of the turn to non-military operations cannot be overlooked or underestimated. Peacetime activities, civil society, and civilians have become targets of warfare and part of battlefield operations. Unlike the fog of war, which describes a condition of uncertainty that military strategy must overcome, Larval warfare draws its efficacy from the amplification of uncertainty and the efficacious exploitation of the effects of uncertainty. Warfare thus becomes indefinite, absolute, and omnipresent, not only via the technological development of weapons of mass destruction, not only via the development of virtual and viral information technologies that make physical and national boundaries irrelevant, but, perhaps more fundamentally, by way of the fog of peace, the proliferation of uncertainty and contingency under cover and within the conditions of peacetime. Threats, especially terrorist threats, are recontextualized and reconceptualized as omnidirectional, synchronous, and asymmetrical problems within informational ecologies that reorganize battle space into endo-militarized or quasi-civilianized vortices. The blurring of military and civilian categories has introduced fundamental changes to the concept and treatment of the category of civilian, as well as has led to an ongoing and indeterminate state of predation that extends larval warfare to planetary scales. Circumventing rather than maintaining boundaries extends the jurisdictional power of larval warfare and its surveillance systems, and the power of those that design and implement them, and leads to the emergence and consolidation of new information infrastructures that is, supranational, planet-wide, socio-technical systems of informational capture and control. Larval warfare becomes part of an emergent system of capitalist digital consumption. That is, part of a larger predatory framework to lure you, the user, in, appropriating you, your identities, your user information, your digital footprints. 
From the discrete and atomistic perspective of the user, larval warfare is not war at all. But from the tentacular perspective of the subversive microagents that undertake larval operations, the user is the frenemy who is ultimately appropriated, whose thoughts and actions are consumed, sucked up, and uploaded. Thus, larval warfare should be approached from the perspective of its trap-like operations, and its agents should be considered hyper-camouflaged predatory operatives in their function as covert capitalist capturing devices. Digital capitalism recapitulates in many respects the founding Olympian myth of Metis, mother and matriarch of magical conjuration and cunning, traits encompassed in the wily word Metis, a term associated with magic, magic tricks, and indeed all things tricky. Quoting from Detienne and Vernon, cunning, tricks, and the ability to seize an opportunity give the weaker competitor the means of triumphing over the stronger, enabling the inferior to outdo the superior rival. To bring about a reversal of the position, Metis must foresee the unforeseeable. Engaged in a world of becoming and confronted with situations which are ambiguous and unfamiliar and whose outcome always lies in the balance, wily intelligence is only able to maintain a hold over being and things thanks to its ability to look beyond the immediate present and foresee a greater or a lesser section of the future. Vigilant and forever on the alert, Metis also appears multiple, many colored and shifting. Finally, Metis, wily intelligence, possesses the most prized cunning of all, the duplicity of the trap, which always presents itself as what it is not, and which conceals its true lethal nature beneath a reassuring exterior. Detienne and Vernon also link Metis with the ruses of the sea, especially to the cunning tactics of the octopus and fish. Metis is fluid, mobile, ever masked, and polymorphous. Metis can bind elements, but can also escape a bond by transforming itself. Metis's subversive power or sorcery lies in its capacity to bind and beguile, that is, to manipulate and transform appearances in order to confront a reality, the polymorphic powers of which render it almost impossible to seize. Larval warfare makes use both of the Anthropocene, a term that refers to the impact of human activity on planetary ecology, and the Electrocene, a term referring to the impact of electronic and computational activity upon human beings. This is a mode of warfare without war. It is latent and capable of exploiting the thresholds between presence, absence, appearance, disappearance, and clarity, opacity. The behaviors of everyday digital life become techniques for distracting, amplifying cultural tensions and insecurities, and opportunities for reconfiguring sublocal and geopolitical balances of power. Hypermediated and hypersecuritized surveillance enmesh with everyday life such that operations of warfare are deployed in normal settings and conflict is ever camouflaged as routinized commercial and consumer activities, thus embroiling the futures of digital and cultural and digital warfare. The tendencies of digital and virtual technologies make it much easier to transcend and circumvent laws, policies, and legislation that depend on the primacy of territorial boundaries and physical spaces. Instead of the laminar and striated geopolitical design of classical state-centered warfare, larval warfare establishes itself in the smooth time spaces of unfriction by exploiting the fog of peace within social and digital arenas that are super saturated with uncertainty. Okay, thank you so much, Nandita, for that presentation. And I'd just like to invite all of us to kind of join together um, to have a chance, first of all, uh, to open this up and to, be before we go to any exterior questions, to see if you've got questions for each other. Um, I see many crossovers and differences, you know, in yeah. both in terms of methodology and discipline, but crossovers in terms of um, aesthetic and political questions that sort of tend your work. Um, so I'm just going to open it up and see if you've got any um, points or questions for each other's presentations. Sure. Can I, I ask you one? Sure, sure. Go ahead. So, um, yeah, so earlier when you were saying like approaches we could, or other approaches we could adopt to counteract or I'm asking you if like could we use this uh, form uh, effect against in the field of operations that we are against the against this I mean do you see it as insurmountable do you see it as a 
because we're addicted to social media for, as a most obvious example that we are the field of operations and it isn't going to, it, it can't be um, made opaque to these yeah. forces. No, I think, um, you know, from the perspective of wily intelligence, you can, something can always be done. You're, ne you're never completely captured. So, I mean, I would say that's why I saw some resonances in what you were saying and what I was saying. Um, it was almost like mine was the dystopian view uh, of, of that equation. But, you know, really every apparatus of capture can be subverted by accidents and crashes and glitches, right? So really, in some senses, the overturning or subverting of the, of the kind of machinations of, of, this, of this larval type of warfare is always possible. It's, it's never total and complete. And I think that, you know, you went, mentioned the word human centrism, and that is so key. I just actually wrote something on AI and human centrism and post posthumanism. But in some senses, um, I think when larval warfare seeks to capture, that's when it's being most human centric. And not only is it being human centric, it's also appealing to human vanities, human um, propensities to think that humans can control tech techne, you know, artifice. So, so I, so my answer, I, you know, short, the short answer is yes, there's always, always the opportunity to subvert this emerging system of capture. Because a lot of the um, people I work with in terms of you know, philosophers of AI are a lot of people seem to be focusing on exactly this uncertainty as a as a sort of innate thing we can't control. Well, you've just said we can't control techno, but like that there's I wonder if there's something in the very patterns you're describing as larval warfare that can be used differently? Yes, or... I think, yes, I think absolutely, absolutely. Um, and in some senses, you know, it's what you do that also um, produces different, um, uh, you know, different productions. So, you know, I, it was funny because my question to you was sort of uh, the flip side of the octopus, which, um, and you mentioned Flusser, and this is actually a, a comment that Flusser wrote in a letter to a friend, where he says, very interestingly, that the animal that's most appropriate to, you know, um, you know the 21st century corporate governance idea is not the behemoth or the leviathan, which was also a sea creature, but the octopus, he says, which sucks up our thoughts, you know, the, the, and he wrote, the, the octopus is sucking up my thoughts, uh, which is the comment that Flusser wrote to, to his friend. So, you know, in some senses, this is the kind of flip side of, of what you were talking about, which is the octopus as a kind of, um, you know, as, as, as the animal of tentacular um, sucking that really uh, is the metaphor of contemporary, you know, global governance, which seeks to capture our actions, our thoughts, and also our future actions, our potential actions, even actions we haven't made yet. So I think that, you know, um, yes, there's always, this is not, this is not absolute in the sense that it can't have multiple 
um, choreographies and, 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 and ways of uh, becoming. But the minute that it seeks, the, the minute that, it, it, that it's captured, that, it, that it's corporatized, that it's monetized, that it's put within the human-centric framework of capitalist political economy and, and, and sort of uh, it's, it's the, the, the kind of distribution of capitalist culture, I think that's when it starts to, um, it starts to have its, its, you know, deleterious effects. And can so I- we've got, a, we've got a kind of, maybe a strip going on with the octopus here, like it no folds on huh? well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Sorry, Amanda, you wanted to say something? I, I was maybe thinking something similar um, in terms of how the, um, let's say the vector or the dynamic of uncertainty or indeterminacy is being framed across your papers. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just thinking off the top of my head kind of thing. I've just um, seen your presentations and I was really interested in uh, Nandita in how you know, indeterminacy and uncertainty is um, utilized, like one can kind of inhabit that space or leverage it um, in terms of particular strategies which have purpose, right? Have cause and effect, um, purpose, purposive um, intent. Absolutely. So whilst one diagnoses like the, let's say the nature of life as being entangled sets of forces that are highly complex, there's still, a kind of vertical, um, vertically induced power, let's say, that theorizes itself into a cause and effect relation by, by actually intervening within those spaces and seeing it's like a transcendental um, cut into those spaces. And so that was really interesting. And it leads me to wonder about the kind of pictures of nature that we're given. You know, that if, if um, life is, a complex of forces um, in a like in a flat ontology or a horizontalist kind of condition, um, where one kind of plays within the scenes of power that are all dispersed. That's one thing because that's a that's then then as you say leveraged in a political field of play and game playing, for where obviously people succeed more than others. Right, we know that. So it's not so horizontal, and then in Maggie's, I was really interested because the, the role of uncertainty in many senses, uh, in terms of like science and art, let's just say, it's like, um, you know, you were, you were telling us that there are many things, many, many things that we don't know about. And by undertaking this kind of practice and research, investigating the kind of unknowns that are out there, but become kind of knowns, but ne perhaps never fully stabilized. But there is a certain idea that the quest, the, the space of what is uncertain is a movable feast, like things get found out and things get lost again. And th so the space of uncertainty in your practice seems much more, um, let's say mobile uh, and uh, kind of contingent uh, than in the space of uncertainty that's leveraged by power in when you talk about, you know, dominance, Nandita, um, for want of a better word. So, yeah, I was really fascinated by the kind of different um, versions of uncertainty or indeterminacy. And finally, just to say with yours, Nandita, I was also struck by how the description of power was really reminiscent to me of another type of um, power that we're very used to historically, and that's the power of leftist critique in situationism, which also loved the um, unacknowledged, invisible, like when you think of even Michel de Certeau, uh, tactics rather than strategies and working from the inside, you know, and um, so yeah. in your graph, you've got, um, you know, things like uh, unacknowledged and undetermined. Well, in many senses, you could say that um, those situationist practices might be determined and unacknowledged and had another, so the, so the left has worked inside of, I'm sure, you know, obviously you know this, 
kind of reproducing or even um, catalyzing as the avant-garde of the neoliberalist formations that we see in these um, forms of authority that you're describing. So yeah, you made me obviously think about a lot and there's a lot there to think about, but yeah, if you have any thoughts about those things, I'd love to hear your ideas. Oh, no, I think your comments are bang on. And it's very interesting because, you know, I've always been interested in the Situationists, known about them. Uh, De Certeau has been sort of this figure that has sort of, I've, I've kind of, my, my career uh, in thinking has gone alongside, but I haven't really um, delved into it until now. So I'm, 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 I'm wonderfully finding out that De Certeau, uh, the Situationist, there's great resources for me in theoretically, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of filling in this idea of warfare in the domain of everyday life. So thank you. I think, I think um, you know, I'll probably be doing a lot more reading in, in that area, but, but um, yes. And, and I think, I, I suppose the, the thing that kind of makes my application a bit unique is that it's in the context of today you know, not in the context of, you know, the 20th century, which has its own uh, ambience, you know, in, in, to use that word. So, so, but you're right. I mean, I, I use the word new, this is a new kind of war, but of course, old and new are also very entangled, right? So I, I, I kind of get annoyed when, when people make, you know, claims about this being a new thing. This is a new, um, you know, I, I don't mean to sort of, make that suggestion there's a new kind of war because warfare because in some senses it's uh bricolaging it's it's sort of borrowing from past uh, practices and 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 kind of um you know repurposing them and and kind of uh re-choreographing them for other purposes and and motives and and intentions so yeah thank you i think you're absolutely right i mean i suppose the only issue now is what is what is the left today, you know? Um, and so it's kind of a very interesting um, pretense to kind of think about uh, this very important political question, which is about, you know, what is happening to the left um, today? That's a huge thing yeah. we didn't um, cover earlier, like to do with that paucity of imagination quote by Amitav Ghosh, I just often feel like the left isn't rising to the occasion. Yeah. In, I mean, yeah, so we're all bifurcating off into lots of different areas. Of and it's really interesting how ideology itself is very confused. I mean, just in terms of Canadian politics, you know, we have three, I would say, historically major political parties. And you're seeing now that when these politicians and these parties are talking, they're actually borrowing from each other's ideological arsenal. So, you know, we have conservatives talking about work and jobs and paid sick leave and things like that, which were historically in the purview of the left, of, of the New Democratic uh, Party in Canada. So it's kind of interesting how ideology is entangled today. And so it's really no wonder that the left, maybe it's a matter of new language games, you know, um, inventing new ways of being left today. Well, Nandita, that kind of brings me, like circles me back to that question on uncertainty that I was thinking about with Maggie's practice as orphan drift. And, uh, you know, one thing that you, you, when you were showing us the installation work and talking about the layering of different um, facets of, um, the, of aesthetics that have certain connotations. So connotations with surrealism, dreamscape, but also um, topographic mapping. And uh, so you have this kind of collision of various aesthetics that are overlaid and like literally laid up uh, 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 like mechanically, but also conceptually. And, and I see that in your work, Maggie, there's this kind of ability for us to kind of detect layers 
in other words, we detect antagonisms and collisions inside the work. But at the same time, we have a whole work, right? We have a unit of work that we go and see or experience. And so that makes me wonder about how artwork and particularly the work you're involved in is not only speaking to sites of collision and disaggregation and um, let's say distinctiveness, but also, so, and also not just hybridity as, as in the institutional relations between layers and whatnot, but the actual concept of unity, right? Uh, like holistic assemblages that can be glued together and produce new forms and new, even if they are temporal stabilities in a plurally complex global environment. So you made me wonder about that because that leads me to kind of think, well, whilst we talked a lot about uncertainty in this presentation, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's also a question about stabilities and unities. And that maybe is for me is the response to the question of the left through art practice and particularly yours. But I don't know what you think about that because I've never talked to you about that before. No, that's amazing. I think that is actually where the pluriverse might come in because that it is a unity made up of lots of difference that coexists simultaneously and is layered or merges, uh, you know, but the there's a huge attempt to um, make things coalesce together, or even though they're distinct. So I think that would be something, I mean, pluriverse is a bit of a mouthful kind of a word that's got used very specifically to do with indigenous knowledge systems, but I actually think this idea of coexistent multiplicities and assemblages and always end up back with Deleuze and Qatari. But, um, but there's some La Ruelle in there too, I think. La Ruelle's kind of idea of, you know, the one. And, and that's how I'm interpreting, um, Amanda, this concept of unity, right? Because it's, it's probably not the unit, the classical notion of unity that you know we're talking about but a, almost kind of a a, um, a theoretical installation idea of unity where you have um you know something that is uh bounded and yet at the same time not necessarily um differentiated yet you know so that's kind of a very interesting headspace to think about you know how are you thinking about that to do with the left Amanda well I think that um just as we were speaking about earlier um that it's been um a sustained uh ideology of the left to purely disaggregate to destabilize, to um, desublimate, you know, to kind of dismantle. And that's been, of course, associated with anti-representationalism um, and also the desire to reject the thinking of the future, right? Because representation and uh, problems of telos, problems of idealism and all the colonial issues that that um, pulls up. But nevertheless, um, you know, that the process of disaggregation in itself produced certain stabilities, as we know, uh, to the point at which we could say that, as Nandita has just described, that um, dominance can effectively deploy and intersect with any of these forms of indeterminacy as if they were objects in themselves, almost. So in it, so the question for the left, for me, is how do we think the we again in, in, in that complex formation is what you're describing Nandita. And I know Lara Well has been doing a lot of work on that in the concept of the generic. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So but well. I think so have Haraway and, and kind of, you know, Cynthia Willett. She has this book, Interspecies Ethics, you know, Rosie Berdotti. I mean, you know, this, th these sort of thinkers who are trying to weaken anthropocentrism and human centrism when it comes to precisely trying to think through um, these ways of, of be becoming. Um, being and becoming together that are that don't constantly replay the dynamic of mastery that really metaphysics and human centered knowledge has have been based on historically. Yeah, and, and I've just seen I'm sorry to say, but I've just seen the time and we're a couple of minutes just heading over. So unfortunately, I will have to close this. Um, we could go on and on and on, right? <laughs> I, 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 I was hesitating because I've just got so many things to ask about in terms of practice and theory and the political. Um, I hope that we can continue these conversations in, in uh, private and public formats in the future. And I just want to say thank you to you both. Um, massive thanks for bringing your work, your practice, your um, ideas, and uh, trying to think through the complexity of not only your own practices, but thinking across each other's work too. And that's been, I said this right at the beginning of the series that we've done an experiment in this series, which is to try and bring people together who might not have encountered each other's work before to try and speak across disciplines. And I know both of you are very um, able, obviously able to do that, but also that's something that has been part of mobilizing your own work. So um, I think we've, We've done really well today in kind of speaking across these um, very, very different but shared territories. And so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to our audience. Thank you again to West Hollywood Public Library. And um, thank you to everyone at CalArts for supporting us um, and for Steph throughout the series and Natalie for um, working so hard on making it all possible. So I'll sign off now and say goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>